with a big, big welcome from me as principal of Green College on behalf of uh, the Green College community, um, uh, especially perhaps its residential community. Um, I, did, I did hesitate a little over that adjective for very obvious reasons. Uh, this is a community of about 100 graduate students and postdoctoral fellows at the University of British Columbia uh, with academic uh, visitors from time to time. Um, not so many visitors at the moment because of the conditions we're all living and working under, but we do have the special privilege this week of having Michelle Good in residence at Green College, living and working, and if she had any time playing with us as we do here on the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Uncommonum speaking Musqueam people. Um, if you can visualize this, this promontory that's um, named Point Grey for some reason, uh, we at Green College are about, oh, 10 minutes walk due north of that fabulous reconciliation pole that Jim Hart and his team, the Haida Reconciliation Pole, UBC's Reconciliation Pole at the other end uh, of Main Mall. It's great to have you here with us for a while. Michelle, thank you for resuming this wonderful series that you've been hosting. This is um, phase two of Colonial Fingerprints and Indigenous Resurgence in the 21st Century. If ever there were a place to look for colonial fingerprints, it would be around Green College, which is based on an old colonial mansion, but um, enough of that history. Let's bring things into the present. Michelle, thank you. This is your series. Who have you got for us today? Well, thank you. And I just wanted to sort of restate um, the title of our series because it says a lot just in the title. And the title is Indigenous Resurgence and Colonial Fingerprints in the 21st Century. And of course, um, you know, those primary fingerprints are the fingerprints that we find on our children as a result of the uh, child removal system. That's what I've started to call it now, thanks to Raven coining it that way. Um, and, you know, that started through the residential schools into the 60s scoop and into the, um, what I call the bastard child of both, which is the child welfare system um, that has uh, focused on uh, colonizing and implementing a form of genocide through child removal, through the displacement of children from, from our communities to break the links of traditional knowledge being conveyed to children um, so that their identity remains intact. Um, with us today is a person who is um, an esteemed colleague who is very well versed both from her own personal experience as well as in her academic endeavors, her teaching and her writing. And I'm delighted to have with us uh, Dr. Raven Sinclair. Uh, Raven is Nehio and Soto uh, and Métis from the George Gordon First Nation in Treaty 4, Saskatchewan. She's a professor of social work at the University of Regina at the Saskatoon campus. And Raven is a survivor of, as I said, the Indigenous Child Removal System. She's a member of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research College of Reviewers, the CIHR Indigenous Research Reference Group, and the Wakabines Bryce Institute of Indigenous Health Research. Raven is the executive producer of a documentary film titled The 60 Scoop in Splatsine First Nation, of, um, where Chief Wayne Christian, a real trailbreaker in this area, uh, continues to lead and an executive producer of the feature film, Trouble in the Garden. And um, most recently I have been reading again, um, a wonderful academic piece that Raven wrote called Lessons from the 60s Scoop. And um, we will, as we normally do, these, um, these events are presented um, and then they, they're posted on the Green College YouTube page and we will post some links to Raven's work at the same time. Um, what I wanted to just, um, in very, very short order, because Raven has lots to say, is just to remind people that uh, I believe that we all have a mandate to reconsider what we think we know. And even today, um, 
there are so many people who still are willing to embrace the notion that residential schools and the other impacts in terms of the removal of children were well-intentioned endeavors. Um, they weren't. Currently, there is a effort going on in Edmonton to rename a boulevard there called the Grand, which is named after Bishop Vital Grandin. Um, one of, who was a key player in promoting and maintaining the residential school system. And in 1875, which isn't long at all in history terms, um, this Bishop stated, we instill in them a pronounced distaste for the native life so that they will be humiliated. Ugh just gets me every time. So they will be humiliated rem when reminded of their origin. When they graduate from our institutions, the children have lost everything native except their blood. This was the intention, and we hear people referring to this as cultural genocide. And to that I say, there is only genocide, period. There are five definitions that are of genocide that are articulated in the genocide conventions. The fifth of those is the wholesale removal of children of one group to another, which is what has been done with Indigenous children for 130 years and longer. And so if we can approach our event tonight with that understanding, uh, I think we can have an open mind to learning things we need to learn so that this cycle can end. And so with that, I'd like to introduce Raven and uh, we will have a conversation. Thank you, Michelle. Tate kaki au noa kumaganak. O te guapet na siga san posa kana tihk ostinia. Um, kita tamas kat noa. Like wa. Many thanks to Michelle for the invitation to speak with you, and uh, I need to say noa ni ski taman a ya absis. Uh, mama so um, uh, what I said was, I, I don't know much. I think I said it quite badly too, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, uh, I don't know much, but uh, I know a little bit. And so that's what I'm going to share with you uh, tonight. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important because, um, you know, we talk about cultural humility and I, I'm not big on the word, um, but how I understand it from my own teachings is that um, it's important to recognize that, uh, you know, our limitations. And so um, for me, it's really about uh, just acknowledging that even though, um, you know, I'm, I'm pushing 60 just about that I still have a lot to learn. I, I'm still a little fledgling, a uh, little fledgling raven in lots of ways. And uh, so, you know, that that title, people put it on you. <laughs> I, I see myself as a jack of many trades, but pretty much an expert of a very few. <laughs> so um, the other the other piece was I just shared with you that my my Cree name is Otkoapit, which is the short short form, and uh, what it means is she sits here. Um, that's the that's also the sort of the short understanding of it, um, and I've carried that name for most of my adult life. I just want to warn you in advance that my, for some reason, my mouse is quite slippery. So sometimes I'll go forward and backwards and, you know, just, just bear with me for that. Um, and I am from uh, George Gordon First Nation, which is in Treaty 4. So it's, uh, it's south of Saskatoon in the southern area of, uh, of the province. And the area that I come from, uh, I come from two groups of Crees, the Calling River Cree and the Touchwood Vile Hills Cree. And our people, historically, we, uh, we that territory had a um, a three nation alliance called the Iron Nation, and so we're we're a real mix of uh, Cree, Assiniboine, and Soto, and and also Métis. So we had a lot of Métis people, you know, migrating out uh, westward, and you know, came to our area, married up with all the beautiful Cree women, and uh, and here we are. Um, and. Uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be here and, and, you know, share with you a little bit of information. So I will just uh, go ahead and, and start. And uh, Michelle actually gave gave me this title to use. And, and initially I thought, hmm, reckoning, that's an interesting word. Um, 
Uh, but, you know, I thought I'm going to just go with this, sort of like a little game I play with myself. And uh, uh, so let's go with it and see where we end up. So this image is of my daughter a few years ago uh, in Kingston, Ontario. We, we, we were just walking around the campus at Queen's and um, it just so happened that Kent Monkman had, a, had a, his, his artwork there. If you ever have a chance to see his artwork, he, he uses lots of different media. Um, but his paintings are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, this is the first time my daughter sort of sat and stared at a painting for a long time. And what struck me about it was um, not only that she was actually sitting still for a while, <laughs> she was very energetic, um, but, but that she was really, you know, really looking at this image and, and taking it in. And of course, you know, this is an image of, of the priest and nuns coming in along with the assistance of the RCMP. So this would probably have been, you know, in the 20s when the when the Indian Act legislation, you know, was law to, to uh, send your kids to the residential schools. Um, so often they were taken by force. And there are also many instances of, you know, later on in the 50s, 60s, probably even 70s and even today, where children are being have been removed uh, by force, uh, social workers in concert with um, RCMP and police, and uh, you know what what struck me about this image was recognizing that my daughter is is among you know a, a, a cadre or hopefully a large population of of youth who do not have to experience um, the things that we experienced and that hopefully. You know, we've, we're doing our work so that they don't have to. And uh, yeah, so before I begin, I just want to make an acknowledgement of, of all the elders and the philosophers and the teachers uh, near and far. It's a very long list. So I, I, I actually started to list them one time. I was like, oh my goodness, I can't possibly include everybody in this list because it's there's so many people. And uh, one of them is, is, well, a couple now are, are with us. So Richard Vidan has... Uh, I've known her for a very long time, Professor Emeritus, and, and Michelle is a, is a professor and author, and uh, I just fish, finished reading her book, Five Little Indians, and if you, if you want a good read, <laughs> check it out. It is absolutely riveting. It's so well done, and uh, you know, it takes you right into the story of that, that juncture between the transition from residential schools to the 60s scoop and urbanization and the AIM movement and just that, you know, that early 60s time frame when things were really starting to move uh, for indig Indigenous people for lots of different reasons. I need to be careful I don't go down into a into an Indigenous studies lecture. So, um, so it's a very long list of people uh, just mentioned too. And, you know, now that I'm getting old, I recognize that everyone has something to teach us, even if we didn't like it in the moment. And, uh, you know, I like to pay homage to my bullies in, in school, <laughs> all the way through school. So the list is long <laughs> uh, <laughs> because even they taught me something. And, uh, and uh, you know, now that, I, now that I've recovered from it and I understand what they taught me, um, it's okay. And uh, I feel grateful. So get an ask them in a while. Thanks to everyone. Gratitude to all. So reckoning, what is reckoning? I had to look it up because it's one of those words, you know, we use it uh, and we just, you know, what does it really mean? And it's like, it, interesting, it had a number of definitions and this one, this one was really sort of timely for the 60s scoop. So it's in a bill, it's a bill account or it's it's settling, settling of that, that bill or account. So very interesting, you know, when we think, uh, when I think about the class actions. Sorry, there are, um, I keep getting distracted by people in the waiting room. So just a, a little bit about my personal background before I jump into into the sort of bigger picture of the scoop. So uh, these, this, these images, this is my adoption ready photograph. And I remember that day, I remember the feel of that little shirt. And um, you know, I should get this colorized because it was a really cute little pink, uh, pink and white checkered shirt. And I loved it, I just loved it. Of course it wasn't mine, they just popped it on me for the picture. <laughs> so I would look all cute and appealing. Nice haircut. I can hear you all saying that. And that's my mother, uh, Ruth Pelche from uh, George Gordon, First Nation. And my father, uh, Raymond Sinclair, was from the neighboring reserve, Kawakatus, uh, or poor, used to be called Poor Man's. 
And, uh, you know, in, in Saskatchewan, uh, my fa father was the exception, but you can generally tell who's from poor man's because the, the English version is actually lean man because Kawakatoos was very tall and very lean. And so nowadays when you see the really, those really lean men, you know, they're probably from Kawakatoos. <laughs> I wish I'd gotten those genes, but I didn't. And uh, so I was, ah, slippery. So I was born in a, in a small town in Oyen, Alberta, uh, and this image of my father, and that's my oldest brother there, um, is, uh, is, is on a farm. My father was a farm, like a farm manager, so he would, he would run farms, and we went from town to town. So I was born in Oyen, and my a couple of my sisters were born in the next town over Serial, and uh, you know, a couple of you will actually know the name, know what these, uh, where these towns are. Um, and then, then uh, when I was very young, my father passed away, and so uh, the the little house there, it's that's not the house we lived in, but it's it's very much like a lot of the houses on the west side of Saskatoon. They're you know wartime houses, and they're very close together, and and uh, that's where we moved to uh, when I was about three, I believe. We came, we all, my mother piled us on into the tra onto the train, and we we came to Saskatoon. And uh, I had I had at that time uh, between eight and 10 brothers and sisters and so we we played outside all day you know we were we were close I I, I was loved unconditionally and uh, and very secure and you know I've spent a lot of years in re recovery uh, psychological emotional recovery from the things that happened and and it was because of the child welfare system which which I have re 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 renamed <laughs> the child the child removal system the indigenous child removal system because it's much more appropriate there when I think about uh, the number of children who uh, have suffered from a really severe level of imposed trauma to me that has nothing to do with welfare that's that's something else and uh, so removal is really much more appropriate. And so we, you know, there were a lot of us living in this little teeny house and um, we didn't have a lot of money, but um, poverty, I don't think is a reason for children to be removed and for their lives to be, you know, really um, uh, turned upside down. But that's what happened to so many of us. There was no reason that, that we, that I should not have been raised with my, with my family and my, and my, my mother. But I was. <laughs> so someone called the police and uh, we were removed and placed into Kilburn Hall in Saskatoon, which is, uh, it used to be like a children's, um, you know, placement home, uh, like an emergency shelter type of uh, institution. Now it's, now it's a youth jail. <laughs> but, but back then, you know, we, we actually have fond memories of Kilburn Hall. Um, sometimes when I can't recall things because I was too little, I was, you know, three and a half, four years old, I'll ask my older sisters and my oldest sister, you know, she said it was just, it was awesome. It was comfortable and warm. The food was great and they took really good care of us. So we didn't have any complaints there, but for every single one of us in my family, where the problems started were the moment we were placed into foster care because uh, those were very dangerous places and they were unvetted. <clears throat> And so, <clears throat> so I was placed into foster care and I was there for about eight months and then, and then I became part of the AIM program. So I was made a crown ward. My mother had no say in any of that. And uh, I was placed into this family, a uh, very white Anglo-Saxon Protestant uh, professional family. My father was a professor, uh, assistant professor at the University of Saskatchewan. He'd been there for six years. My mother was a psychiatric nurse and she worked at RUH uh, sporadically. And uh, my father went on sabbatical. So within a few months after my placement, uh, just after I turned five, uh, we moved to West Germany because my father wanted to study under a philosopher there for the year. So we went uh, in the spring of, I think it was about 1966 and um, stayed there for over just over a year. So that image is is Amsterdam just shortly after we had arrived, and uh, <clears throat> you know I have fond memories of Germany. It was uh, very interesting. We lived in a small town that was actually sort of the the epicenter of Nazism, but I was treated really well. So so uh, yeah, it was uh, very interesting. You know the the context in which you find find yourself. So I started school uh, in West Germany and. Um, 
and then came back and uh, this this house on the right here this bungalow is uh, that it's that's not the house I lived in but it's very very similar to it so I really you know transitioned into a new world and and I have this phrase liminal spaces there because from the moment that I was placed um, and this is so true for so many of us uh, we had to learn especially if we were older we had to learn a, a new world because that world had a different socialization it had different rules it had different expectations and uh, you name it everything was different and you know i remember walking into that house the first time and it was everything was so shiny there was lots of chrome and uh, you know it was it was a brand new house and then we moved to ontario and the house we moved in this is this is identical to the house that we lived in although it's just down the street it's actually a house uh, in Toronto that, that's down the street from the house that we live in and uh, you know so I grew up in, in a very different sort of context than um, than the one that I had with my family and it's not better or worse just different <laughs> so it catapulted me into this uh, very unique uh, unique space of having to learn I had to learn quite rapidly you know uh, things like all the forks and knives that you know that non-indigenous people use it's like you have to learn all those rules and we weren't allowed to eat with our elbows on the table and you know we could we were doing it right here just 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 some strange stuff and uh you know i'm still still wondering the the purpose of that but uh, that's just that's part of the you know that victorian influenced uh british heritage uh, one of the other important things that I learned was uh, don't get dirty. So um, the house that we lived in was brand new. The backyard had not been landscaped yet. And uh, I remember uh, going to play in the dirt. And by this time, I had already learned the rules about uh, not getting dirty. And there was a, there were consequences for that. Uh, my mother's ire and her sometimes her rage. And um, so I, I remember, you know, sitting there and thinking, I, I want to play in this dirt. I want to, like, you know, roll around in it, <laughs> just, you know, make rivers and that sort of thing. Um, but I also had quickly learned the rule that um, getting dirty had came with too high a cost. And so I, I, I didn't. And from that moment on in my life, uh, I didn't get dirty. And it's it's uh, now I do because, you know, I'll do construction and so on outside. But. But it's still, you know, it's still a bit of a trigger for me. Um, so I'm going to have to go roll in the dirt just to defy that. So I grew, so I grew up in, you know, in a very different context, and uh, my life was really fraught with um, with racism and discrimination. I didn't see another Indigenous person until, uh, let's see, I was about um, eleven, and we were driving from Ontario to BC. Uh, to visit relatives and we stopped at um, there was a sign that said powwow this way with a big arrow and so we went it was it was the uh, Sik Sika powwow and uh, we got there and got out of the car and I saw all these brown people <laughs> I got scared <laughs> I got terrified and uh, I thought oh no they're gonna steal me back and I didn't know what it meant to be indigenous I didn't know who these people were or anything about them all I knew was my family, and so um, so I ran to the car and I locked myself inside. Um, and I and you know I remember too having having just sort of almost a physical sensation of of social workers and confusion, and and it was just too much for me. Um, and then I saw another Indigenous person when I was in high school, uh, someone in my in my grade eleven class, uh, just before I dropped out of high school, and uh, you know I remember sort of peeking at her sideways and. Um, now, when I look back, I think she was probably also an adoptee, and we did not uh, speak to each other ever. <laughs> yeah. So, um, oops. Uh, so I I did drop out. I did a few interesting things. I keep in mind this was the late seventies, right? So you know, what did people get up to in the in the in the mid to late seventies? Yeah, it was a psychedelic time. I won't say any more. <laughs> And what's said here stays here, right? <laughs> but again, you know, those sorts of experiences, um, they 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 inform our lives, and uh, and I'm glad I had those experiences, and I'm glad I you know I stopped having those experiences when I did, uh, so that not too much damage was done. But you know, if you find me strange, that could that could be why. 
Um, but yeah, and, and then I, you know, I joined the military. Um, uh, I did summer, the summer uh, reserve program. I did basic training. I did very well. I liked the order and the structure. And uh, you know, I was talking to Richard the other day. He, he did a talk in my class and he, you know, it was a good reminder that, um, that many of, you know, many generations of our people went through those types of total institutions. And a total institution is one that where they have absolute power over you and control over you and they can they can fund they can sort of alter you at a very core level and that's the purpose of them. So the military it's to to break you down and create you into a soldier who will do what you're told when you're told to do it and also to hate because you have to hate people to kill them. <laughs> and the residential schools it was to uh, break indigenous children down and b build them back up in into uh, into white people, uh, white Canadians who would be absorbed into the body politic. And uh, yeah, but you know, I I I, I met a psychic. <laughs> I was going to go into the base into the uh, regular forces, and I was going to be an electronics technician. So my career was going to be to go around the country fixing phones on military bases. Um, that's all women could do at that time. And uh, I met a psychic who said, no, you have, you have some things, you, ha you have a lot of things to do in this life. And if you go into the military, you're going to do none of them. And, you know, there was something about that message that really resonated for me. I met her that one time and never, ever saw her again. <laughs> so I was like, you know, there was this urgent message coming to me uh, that this was not my path. And so, you know, even at that age, I guess I listened and I, I didn't go there and I didn't know what I wanted to do or what I was going to do. Um, but, you know, I just knew the military wasn't it. So I floated around, did construction work and this and that. And then I, uh, I came across uh, the sign for this transitional year program at the University of Toronto. I was vis visiting my mother one day and, um, and I thought, you know, I, I've always wanted to go to university. So I think I'll, I'll do this. <clears throat> and I was registered, you know, within a few days and I started, uh, you know, within a few weeks. So this was September of 19, uh, 1981, I think, 1980, 81. And, uh, and that was really the start of my university career. So I, I went into university then. I went into this transitional year program. And, uh, and I've never left university. So <clears throat> it's the one addiction in my life that has been a very fruitful one, <laughs> Be education. So if you're going to get addicted to anything, get addicted to education. And, uh, I, you know, I, I'm the first Indigenous person to graduate from that program. And uh, it, it, that's sort of an interesting thought, you know. Um, but it was, it was a good program. And it really opened up doors for me to go into university. Now, because of, you know, the trauma that I experienced and the racism and bullying and, and you know, I really I, I came to this place of real self-hatred. Um, I, I didn't want to be Indigenous. I didn't know where I fit. Um, I was... I was dissociated for most of my young life because of the sexual abuse I experienced in foster care. And, uh, you know, I, I just really was just trying to put one foot in front of the other. Um, and it's so it's difficult. It's difficult to function well when you're a child of trauma, particularly if you haven't yet, you know, taken the steps to recover because uh, you're then confronted with with all of these these different dynamics. Um, so, but within a few years, you know, I, I, um, I had a summer job with, uh, immigration, <laughs> what a place to work. It's fraught with racism. <laughs> we, we don't pick and choose where we go in this life, right? For the most part. But, um, but I had a chance to observe, you know, the racism towards other people of color and minorities who were seeking refuge in, in Canada. And, uh, I made a good friend there who's a friend today. And I, you know, I had this dream that I was, I was in this, I kept having this recurring dream of being in this black sort of pit and I couldn't get out and the sides were all slippery. And so I told my friend and, and uh, Jane and she said, oh, Raven, you need therapy. <laughs> so this is when I was about 22, 23 and I, I started on my, on my healing journey. So I worked with a Gestalt therapist for a couple of years and then it was just, you know, I, I, I did everything that I could. I went to I went to groups, I went to um, uh, individual therapy. I, uh, yeah, I did all, all sorts of recovery work. And I would say that that recovery work, um, that I engaged in it, and it took about 10 years for me to get to the point where I was back in my body and stable enough to think about 
my future and a career. And uh, in the meantime, I worked full time and, you know, I would take a class here and there. So after 10 years, I got through, you know, my what was into the end of my second year of university. Uh, so it was it was really slow going. Um, I didn't have my status either because uh, um, I was Bill C-31. Um, you know, I, I was at work one day and, and one of my colleagues who's a Métis researcher, this was 1985, said, oh, this Bill C-31 has come out. You know, are you going to apply? And I said, well, I can't apply because I'm Métis. Uh, it says so on my adoption, you know, my adoption non-identifying information. And she said, have you looked in the mirror? <laughs> so I went and looked in the mirror. I was like, what? <laughs> I see a white person. <laughs> and I'm quite, I'm serious about that. Um, I, I did really, you know, I, 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 I thought I was white for the longest time. But this time, you know, I was starting to understand, no, no, I'm Indigenous. Um, and I had surrounded myself with in, Indigenous people. I worked for Treaty 9 uh, in Toronto. And anyways, this researcher, Pat Sochak, she said, uh, oh, no, you're not Métis. <laughs> you apply for your status. And so I did. It took six years, but I applied for my status. And uh, and 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 that was amazing, too, because it gave me then uh, a huge sense of identity that I actually I belong to a community that my family, you know, my family was 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 part of a, a bigger community, not just one, but two. You know, we could actually choose which band to belong to. Of course, we went with our mothers because that's what you do in Cree territory. Um, and, and this really triggered an interest in me, a desire in me to learn about our collective history and in particular to learn about what happened to me. Because I grew up thinking I was the only one. I didn't see other Indigenous people. Um, but then as I got to university and, you know, started to go to protests and that sort of thing, I became a bit of an, uh, you know, a social activist. A lefty right from the start. Um, I um, I started to meet more and more Indigenous people who were urbanized first and then secondly more that were adopted and you know I was kind of like suspicious and resentful because there's something nice about thinking you're the only one of something but <laughs> that's just that's just part of the you know the altering of the the thinking patterns that really serve to separate us and uh, so I I got curious, what happened? Why did this happen to us? So I, um, I took history, I took Canadian history at the University of Toronto. And uh, <laughs> I think in the second class, there was a little blurb about 10 minutes long from the professor about the um, basically the signing of the treaties and the establishment of the reserve system. And that was the sum total of Indigenous history in my, uh, you know, my uh, undergraduate degree at the University of Toronto. So I left that class after that after that second one and I and I withdrew and I joined I took medieval history which was much more interesting and uh, it wasn't until um, about 1988 so I was just about done my degree I was still you know on my recovery journey and I uh, I got a call what happened uh, oh yeah this woman also this Pat Sochak she said um, one day she said, "Are you, have you found your family? Like, have you reconnected with them? And I said, oh, no, I wouldn't. I wouldn't even know how to begin. And she said, oh, my. <laughs> she said, you're a Sinclair. <laughs> Send a letter to Jim Sinclair. He's probably your relative. So I did. I said, to, uh, now Jim Sinclair, of course, everybody knows him now. He's very famous. Um, and uh, uh, he was president of the Métis and Non-Status Indians of Saskatchewan. Uh, you know, an incredible... Uh, political leader and advocate and uh, turns out he is my father's first cousin so he was my uncle and uh, within days um, I got a letter from or I got a phone call from my sister so 11 days later it took me 11 days to find my family you know I feel for people that spend years searching because for me it was it was really easy and it is for most indigenous people you know if, if if as long as you know your last name or if you know have an idea of your nation or your band you can find your family really, really quickly. And for many, it's actually been too quick. I've known, I know lots of uh, survivors who, you know, they, they found out their band and then they called, um, you know, might've been for, to apply for funding for school or something and ended up talking to a cousin or, or said, or, or the person said, Oh, I know who you are. Hang on. And then, you know, then their mother gets on the phone or their auntie or their, you know, uh, or their cousin. And um, 
Yeah, so uh, we have a sort of a pretty unique so con social context uh, in Indigenous country. So this image then is is um, it, it was a few years later that I came you know I came to Saskatchewan I came to be with my family to reconnect with them, and that was a thirty year journey. So I've I've been here since nineteen eighty eight, which is what uh, thirty three years, and it's about thirty years that it took for me to reconnect to reestablish those uh, those bonds those the, that love that so many people just take for granted, uh, but for us it was it was. It was really, really tough, and and many families never are able to um, to reestablish those bonds. It's the hardest thing to do because, uh, you know, there may be anger and jealousy and resentment that are that are that are you know dynamics within within your family in that in that reunification, and we tend to run from those things. So for all of us to stick it out and you know keep coming together and keep sort of trying and working it through. Man, I think like we deserve the medal. <laughs> we deserve the family reunification gold medal. Uh, but I love them dearly, and uh, and they're also what keep me here in Saskatoon. Uh, but I went. I I I was driving along on my motorcycle one day. I was very cool when I was younger, and uh, I saw this building, and it said Saskatchewan Indian Federated College. And I thought, hey, I want to go see what that's about. So I went in, and I ended up talking to Chester Knight. The famous Chester Knight, and uh, he was kind of thrilled with my story, and I think he was more thrilled with the fact that I was really hot, and uh, wearing wearing a leather jacket and driving a motorcycle. <laughs> I'm not joking. <laughs> I was hot, and uh, but I, but he he was he was really enthusiastic and kind and helpful, and I was registered within days, like. And I started. Uh, I started in January of 1995. I started at uh, SIFC, and that's where I took my first social work degree. And I have to tell you that it's the best educational experience I've ever had. It filled in all of the gaps. I learned how to write from Janis Akus. I learned how to uh, um, how to uh, research history uh, uh, from from Sheldon Sheldon. Can't remember his last name. He's the lawyer guy. Michelle, you probably know his last name. And uh, uh, you know, I learned about, um, oh, I just learned so much, went to culture camp for the first time. It was really, really an incredible experience. And I put my heart and soul into it. And and some of the things I learned then, it was it was where I got the answers about what happened to me. Because it put uh, my child welfare experience into the context of Indigenous history. And the history of colonialism and oppression. And so this image is of the Fort Capel Industrial School. It's the first residential school in uh, in Canada, and it was a terrible place. It was terrible uh, violence and sexual abuse, and uh, I think in many of our families we can trace the you know the the violence and sexual abuse from this particular experience. But what's interesting here is those teepees camped outside of the fence, right? That was the closest the families could get. And they would be there so that they could, you know, catch sight of their children. And I'm sure for the children, it was comforting to know that the, the parents, the families were right there. Now, that didn't last for very long. So this is in the mid-1800s. You know, by 1900, it was, that wouldn't have happened. They would have been chased off by the RCMP. So the 60s scoop then, what is it? Well, it's, it's you know, we many of us know by now that it's the large scale apprehension of indigenous children starting as early as the 1940s. And, uh, and placement into white, predominantly white foster and adoptive homes. Occasionally children were placed in indigenous homes, but that was very, very rare. Um, and, you know, many of the dynamics are still the same because the children were placed into nations that were not their own. So they may have, you know, they may have, um, have had some sort of visual, you know, similarities, but uh, in terms of family, community, culture, traditions, language, uh, they were still dislocated and removed. So this term was coined by Patrick Johnston in 1983, and it came from this woman here, Bridget Moran. Um, she wrote this book called *The Little Rebellion*, and uh, it, it was hard. It went out of print, but I did manage to find it on uh, Amazon. And uh, the story is of her experience as a child welfare worker in BC in the early 60s, and she was horrified by what she saw. And she said that, she said, you know, uh, we were scooping, we were literally scooping kids and placing them into homes about which we knew nothing. 
She said, no matter how we cloaked our, our actions in child welfare jargon, uh, we were putting those children at risk. And then she said, the BC, the, BC, the BC government was the biggest contributor to child abuse in the province. Well, as her employer, how do you think they took that? <laughs> It was it was not good. So she also tells a little bit about that story here about being vilified in some of the newspaper articles that came out that, you know, tried to frame her as crazy. And uh, um, yeah, that she'd lost her mind. And, and what's interesting is when I first heard her name, it's, it's funny how information, you know, is transmitted to us, because when I first heard about her, I thought, oh, yeah, she's the crazy lady. And I was like, where did that come from? Because, you know, I, when I was younger, I didn't pay too much attention to news. So how is it that I had this sort of construction of her as the crazy lady? And uh, but now that I know the truth, that she wasn't crazy at all. She was speaking. She was speaking the truth about what's, what was happening uh, to Indigenous children. And she continued to advocate outside of the system, of course, um, for the next uh, 40, 40, 50 years and just passed away within the last uh, last i think 6 7 years and so she was um she was honored in a blanketing ceremony um by a community i'm not sure which one um people who live on the west coast would probably know just from that blanket but i like to you know lift my hands up to people like bridget um who who were among our strongest allies so what we know is between 1951 and 91, approximately 22,400 status Indian and Inuit children were placed in primarily non-Indigenous foster and adoptive homes. And if we include Métis children, the number is going to be pushing about 40, 45,000 uh, children. And, uh, you know, when you think about it, there were, I think, 30, 20, 28 or 38,000 um, residential school survivors who went through the um, common experience payment process. So the numbers are really quite quite similar. And uh, I think it was uh, another another relative, um, Marie Sinclair, who said that, um, you know, and we know this, that the, pri the primary difference was that we, we were completely isolated. We didn't even get to see our siblings and, um, you know, other indigenous uh, children and families at all. Um, in residential schools, the children at least had each other. And for the few adoptees who were adopted in sibling groups or they were, you know, twins adopted into the same home, um, generally, generally the rule was uh, complete, complete dislocation. And so this image, um, a good friend of mine, Colleen Cardinal, is an adoptee advocate and has worked tirelessly to uh, on behalf of adoptees and to bring us together to do land-based um, gatherings and and she has uh, done this this interactive map where you can go and um, and read some of the stories and see basically the the indigenous adoptee diaspora and so th this particular image is one of the first iterations of that map um, but uh, you can see that we were really uh, we were dislocated around the world. There are there are adoptees who were raised in South America, uh, Brazil, and Argentina, and you know they don't they don't even speak English. <laughs> and and there's some stories of uh, there's a story of a woman who there was a a conference and I think it was an AFN conference in Stockholm, and. She went running up to them and, I mean, could barely speak any English, but said, I, I'm, I'm like you, I'm like you, can you help me? And she had been adopted and uh, uh, her family moved to, um, to Sweden and she ended up basically on the street uh, in Stockholm. And she did eventually make her way back. And another woman who was in, uh, raised in Scotland um, from the West Coast who came back and, you know, the... The challenges for people uh, being raised in different cultures, whether it's in Canada or whether it's around the world, are just are just tremendous. I think if you then speak another language other than English, um, it just it makes it that much harder um, because then you can't you can't even communicate. So so the diaspora is is global, and uh, I know adoptees from all of these countries: Scotland, Ireland, England, New Zealand, Fiji, Australia, um, South America. And uh, I don't know of any raised in, in Africa, but I know there are some. 
So social work really, I mean, it, 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 it came, the reason that, that the scoop sort of happened was, um, was really political. <laughs> so, so the federal and provincial governments were arguing about jurisdiction and, um, and, and social workers in particular were, were lobbying for involvement at the provincial level into the lives of indigenous people, into the welfare of indigenous people. And so when the 1951 amendments to the Indian Act transferred child welfare jurisdiction to the provinces, then, um, then this is the point at which social workers, they had at, in the same time frame, 1949 in particular, 47, 49, had lobbied um, the Senate and House of Commons to, to be, in, be able to be involved in delivering welfare services to Indians uh, in the cities and then on reserves as well. And, uh, and this was approved and, and within a year there were nine social worker positions across the country. And so now we see from that point, 1950 into the sixties, this, this tremendous proliferation of, um, of, of social work offices. <laughs> and, uh, then in the sixties, uh, the Canada assistance program, which which really sort of solidified federal transfers of money to the provinces to support, you know, um, child welfare and health and education and those sorts of things. Um, that's when we see this this tremendous growth of of social work as a as an institution in the in each province. And isn't it interesting that that's the same time it, you know time frame in which Indigenous children suddenly are being removed en masse. So occasionally we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, the chicken and egg question. <laughs> was there a problem that social workers intervened in or did the sudden explosion of the social worker population uh, that create the problem that, that wasn't really there? And it's a difficult question to, you know, to grapple with because when we think about it, we were at a point of four or five, six generations of residential school survivors and and yeah those were those were for the most part pretty horrible places and so it did create um you know social disarray and and issues with parenting and um you know all sorts of things and and uh uh but but you know it, it, it's not um a, a lot of times what happened was when social workers went into communities uh, into indigenous homes the things that they were seeing were poverty related, not, you know, not residential school related, although poverty is, we could argue is sort of goes hand in hand, <laughs> right? It's, it's, uh, it's the sort of disenfranchisement of indigenous people as if we ever were enfranchised sort of in, in the Canadian body politic, right? Um, so poverty and marginalization and exclusion, discrimination, they all sort of go hand in hand, but lots of times that's what, uh, that's what social workers were seeing. So if, you know, imagine being a fairly, you know, it was wealthy people that went to university back in, in the 60s, right? 50s and 60s. Imagine being a very privileged white uh, social worker, all fresh out of university, and then you go, you go into a community and you go into a house and you don't see the things that you expect to see, right? Maybe you don't see a fridge or or running water or um, a washer and dryer. Um, you know, you see these these things hanging and you don't see them as food, you just, you see them as something horrible and disgusting, right? Um, so, yeah, so, so the scoop is really also about a clash of cultures and, and more. <laughs> the more is really uh, that, that Canada is, is, is a racist nation, is founded upon principles of, of racism and eugenics and, and, uh, so here's just a couple of quotes, you know, so that we don't, we don't, uh, you turn a blind eye to some of the, you know, some of the early sort of philosophies that, that, uh, that settlers, you know, just spouted <laughs> at will. And it was, you know, perfectly acceptable. So William Lyon Mackenzie King suggested Canada should remain a white man's country, not only desirable for economic and social reasons, but also highly necessary on political and national grounds, right? Well, that's, that's racist. <laughs> Straight up, right? The Prime Minister from 1921 to 1948. And then one of our earliest, uh, you know, renowned social workers, uh, Charlotte Witten, founding director of the Canadian Council on Child Welfare from 1920 to 41. They were good friends. <laughs> Stated, our task and resources are bent to the task of keeping this country strong, virile, 
healthy and moral, and we insist that the blood that enters its veins must be equally pure and free of taint. And so, you know, uh, this this is appropriate to sort of contemporary politics, right? It's like, let's put up that wall and keep those people out. And uh, uh, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It was ridiculous then, it's ridiculous now because we have to, you know, we have to have uh, immigration in order to sort of st sustain our population and uh, be remotely, I think, be remotely interesting as a country. So, so our, you know, uh, and we can look back even further, and, and it's important to do that. And this is sort of one of the things that, you know, medieval history uh, and, and political, uh, political science really helped me to understand was that um, this, is, this is an issue uh, in, in, in our sort of human philosophies going, going way back to ancient times. And, uh, you know, look at, uh, look at the writings of uh, Hobbes and Locke. And uh, I mean, was it was it was it Hobbes that described us as um, as wild wild savages running through the woods of North America, and then the other one said that uh, said that um, you know the life of the life of that our lives you know must have been nasty, brutish, and short. <laughs> they really knew nothing about us. And what's interesting is I have gone into rooms and, and talked to people and said, you know, you know, not, with social workers and said, you know, nothing about us. You have no idea. And this, so this, here we are. Uh, what is it? A thousand years later. <laughs> and uh, it's, it's the same problem. Well, 800 years. Um, is that, you know, we can, we can operate on, on all of these assumptions and, and until we like actually sort of educate ourselves. Um, you know, we can, and then this is really the, the, the context of the scoop, right? It's that the the racist assumptions that Indigenous people are not fit for raising children, we're, we're sort of, you know, we're still sort of conceived of as subhuman, not to be trusted, to be looked upon with suspicion. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, that's, the, that was the justification back then, and it's justification now. Yeah, so the reckoning then, you know, to mention that is that, uh, we have to stop it. We're going to stop it. So, uh, so the scooping then from the 1950s to 1985, and this is sort of just a little bit of a, a timeline. Uh, the 1966, you know, the infusion of federal dollars into provincial uh, operations. Um, I'll jump ahead. So 1985 was the Kimmelman moratorium. So that was uh, Justice Kimmelman in Manitoba examined the child welfare system because indigenous people were saying what are you doing with our children they're they're being uh, you know there's problems here they're being abused and they're being sent all over the place willy-nilly um and in manitoba many many children were being sent into the midwest states right farm labor free farm labor a global phenomenon and uh so kemelman institute he said this is genesis this is genocide <laughs> and um he implemented a moratorium on on the, the transracial adoption of indigenous children. What happened is this didn't stop the removal of children. It just it just institutionalized us. So foster care, you know, long term permanent foster care, um, group homes, and so on. Um, and then in two thousand and five, Justice Ryan uh, Frostley said that, you know, it's it's really. It, it's a charter challenge. It's unconstitutional to not allow children to have a permanent home. And, and we can agree with that, but, um, but for indigenous families, it's really about uh, being, and communities, it's about being involved at that time. Now it's about jurisdiction, right? And so now we've moved into this era where all of our children, most of our children, there's very few that are adopted, uh, are in foster care. And, um, and foster care is an economy, um, and it's it's a pretty it's a pretty powerful economy, and uh, lots of res there's lots of resistance to to changing that because because people benefit right foster parents benefit uh, social workers benefit because they have jobs right and and this whole sort of this foster care scoop is really uh, it's it's underpinned by this Supreme Court ruling in 1983, uh, Racine and Woods. And what happened in this particular case, uh, let me just pop ahead and see if I've got, uh, no, I don't, oh, there it is. Yeah, so this particular case is the foster parents, this mother, uh, she basically, you know, asked her friends if they would watch her daughter. 
and uh, and they said okay, and then um, then she went, she was, uh, she went into treatment, and she went back. It was quite a bit later, like a year, might have been two, and uh, they wanted to keep her, and she wanted her child back, and so um, she went to her school and just took her, and which is a no no, <laughs> and so um, so they went to court, and uh, in court um, the mother lost. And the child stayed with the foster parents. So, um, so the mother uh, appealed, and at the the appeal court, she won, and uh, and the child was ordered to stay with her based on you know the significance of the primal bond with the mother, and and uh, culture and language and that sort of thing. So then it went to the Supreme Court, and at the Supreme Court, um, the foster parents won. So the Racines won, and uh, Justice Wilson said. Uh, uh, in her decision, there were two sort of key points. And one was that she said, over over time, the significance of culture abates, or it, it gets less. And uh, <laughs> I mean, one of the psychologists says, said uh, literally, um, you know, oh, this culture thing isn't, it, it's not as important. And I mean, I'm, I, oh, it's horrifying to read, really, because it's just, it's absolutely, it's, it's what we call a legal fiction. This whole case is just a legal fiction. And it's sort of like the doctrine of discovery, right? I, that, um, um, you know, these territories are free for the taking because I say so. <laughs> or, or or the doctrine of terra nullius, this land is empty because I say so. <laughs> yeah, I may see all of these indigenous people, but I want it to be empty, so it is. Right? That's a legal fiction. Uh, but it's embedded, in our, it's embedded in our legal system. So the second thing she said was that precedence has to be given to bonding with the foster parents. And uh, what's interesting is that, you know, it's never, they don't ever consider, well, what about the, it, the original bonding with, with birth parents? So both of these arguments are so flawed. And she said, this child should not be allowed to become a battleground in the courts or in the media. And when the test to be met is the best interest of the child, the significance of cultural background and heritage over bonding uh, abates over time. Absolutely untrue. And uh, so in research, neither are true. They're based on absolute fiction and fancy. But the problem is that Supreme Court decisions bind lower courts. So, you know, if, if, if I'm a mom and my child is in care and, you know, I go to court and the lawyer brings up Racine and Woods, then the judge has to, has to take it into account. So my, my goal <laughs> is to, uh, is to um, really, un excuse me, is to really um, attack this case uh, from as many angles as possible um, and and really uh, have it so that it's not used in court. And it may be that the current Bill C-92, which gives jurisdiction over child welfare to Indigenous people, um, you know, may be a moot point. But I just want to share with you this, uh, this image here. So I have a, a, a research project. It's, I'm just at the tail end of a five-year Social Science and Humanities Research Council grant. And this is part of my team. Um, most of the investigators, 24 investigators across the country. And, uh, and this, this, is, this is part of my team. And, um, and we had a special guest that day, and it was Letitia Racine. And so we just took the opportunity to gift her with a blanket and thank her for, <laughs> you know, for everything that she went through and, uh, and for, for staying alive, <laughs> you know, and, and many of us, you know, we, we, we marvel at the fact that we survived our, our experiences. Um, and so Letitia is a really awesome person. And, and like all of us, you know, she's got her, her struggles with identity and learning the culture and, uh, you know, and that's exacerbated by any of sort of the, the personal anguish that we need to contend with. But I'm happy to consider her a friend and, uh, so I'm just going to pop back. Doo, 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 doo. Oh, yes. So the timeline. And here's here's some interesting, you know, truth about the the 60s scoop and the foster care scoop. So Cindy Blackstock, of course, you know, all credit to her genius. Talks around the corner. In the oh, I can hear you speaking. Something's around the corner. <laughs> what is it? Oh, the pot. <laughs> uh, I hope it's a cooking pot. Okay, um, the foster care math game, I call it. 
So Cindy and her research, um, you know, and she's won this incredible victory at the uh, Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, uh, to which Canada has ignored, I think, 10 or 11 uh, compliance orders um, to start giving First Nations equitable funding for child welfare services. <laughs> And uh, so they ignore those rulings, but then they're sort of slipping funds around through the back door here and there. Uh, but her, her math, she uh, calculated, she and her team calculated that between 1989 and 2012, Indigenous children, status children and Inuit children spent the equivalent of 66 million nights in foster care. And so, you know, I was thinking about this. It's like 66 million nights is about 280,000 years. And I don't know about you, but I can't even conceptualize what 280,000 years is in time. And so when we think about it in terms of sort of the, the sum total uh, of transmission of language and, and love and care and um, traditional teachings and knowledge, I, I mean, it's... It's it, it's mind blowing at what that that amount of time and the longevity uh, can do to nations uh, in our country. Uh, so I got curious and I thought, well, I'm just going to do this little calculation here about the money involved, because I thought, you know, sixty six million nights. Well, that's a lot of that's a lot a lot of foster care payments. <laughs> and so I've heard rates between twenty five and seventy six dollars a day. So I thought I'm going to be conservative in my estimates. So I calculated at 66, um, at $50 a day. And um, any guesses about how much that amounts to? I'll tell you, it's about $3.4 billion. And uh, so if we add uh, about 1250 a day, again, it's a conservative estimate in child tax benefits that goes into provincial coffers, that amounts to, uh, that amounts to a, a, another significant, really significant amount of money. And I actually need to just shrink this down so I can see my calculations here. So 3.3 billion. And then the child tax benefit 825 million into provincial coffers. And so over 23 years, it's $4.125 billion. So then when we, we calculate that per year, it's $317 million in foster care and child tax payments. And and not all the provinces have the same, uh, you know, amount of uh, number of Indigenous children in care. Some have very few. Some have tons, like Saskatchewan, <laughs> the Western provinces. So if we divide that among them six main provinces, that's about $50 million per year, or $4.16 million per month. And if we go even more conservatively, $3 million a month. So that doesn't include um, that doesn't include um, per capita federal transfers for you know infrastructure and programming and those sorts of things. This is an economy. There's a lot of money being made. People are making salaries. People are making a lot of money on the backs of our children and our families. And so there's a tremendous investment in and perpetuation of the system because it benefits a lot of people. And it's an interesting conversation for us to have right now because in social work, child welfare is going to change. And I'm starting to tell my students that, um, you know, there may, there'll be jobs, you'll be working on the reserve, you'll be working for First Nations. You won't be working for, you know, the, the, uh, the urban uh, child welfare, um, the ministry. And so the scoop, again, we're being, children are being scooped through the foster care system using this Racine and Woods article. So what happens is, you know, coincidentally, um, agencies have created um, policies that if a child is in with foster parents, you know, they, they, they're, a, they're a temporary ward, perhaps, um, all they have to do is refuse to return the child. The, you know, the social workers may have worked with them for a year on a, on a transition to home <laughs> process. And all they have to do is say no. And, and the agencies, urban you know, ministry agencies across the country then are required to allow them their day in court. They can go to court and they can, they can argue for why this child, child who's not theirs should be allowed to stay with them permanently. Now, when we say permanently, permanently isn't like forever. <laughs> 
Do you know how long forever is? <laughs> well, in child welfare, it's to the age of 18. That's permanently and that's forever. And then once they're 18 and the money starts flowing in, now we have this, this you know, population of children who are, uh, who are basically being tossed out onto the street. Is that about love and care of children? Is that about child welfare? I, I venture that it's not. That's about money. And when the checks stop flowing, um, then the love and the care stops flowing as well. Or whatever it is that, you know, the, the, yeah, the obligation to care for the child in exchange for, for funds. And that's really, really problematic. Children are vulner vul vulnerable enough when they're in care. Um, but to be a paycheck is terrible. And the interesting thing is that when I was doing my, you know, my senior training uh, in undergraduate about 1996, 97, I, um, at that time, um, it was, it, what was happening was indigenous children were invariably being called special needs. And when a child is special needs and they're a ward or even a temporary ward of the, of the crown, the province, um, the, the money, you know, the, the bank account just sort of opens. <laughs> so the rates are much higher and pretty much anything the foster parents want, um, you know, they can get, whether it's, uh, you know, bikes or sporting equipment or lessons, they can, they can get that. And, you know, I, I, there's families who had like five or six children. And so they were making over $20,000 a month in, uh, in, in foster parenting, uh, these, these groups of indigenous children. That's a lucrative, that's a lucrative income. Uh, and even today, there's a community in, uh, I believe it's uh, Newfoundland Labrador territory, where almost the, the sole source of income is to foster the Innu children. And that's really scary to me, right? Because then there's going to be lots of motivation for, um, for the removal of Indigenous children. So occasionally, Occasionally we have a win and I get asked by lawyers to, you know, to come in and speak about um, the, the problematics about children being raised outside of culture, the psychological, emotional uh, turmoil. And, uh, but mostly we lose still because of this Racine and Woods court case. Um, yeah, and you know, the, the cases are, are, are really awful. Children being still being removed for basically no reason. And in one case where a, a woman lost her two boys for 10 years, it was the only reason they weren't returned. I mean, she, she sobered up, she left her abusive husband. Um, you know, she started her own business and she raised another child who's never had any exposure to the system, but still, you know, I got called in to do a, a parenting capacity assessment. And what I discovered from her meticulous, uh, recording of phone calls, every single email, is that the social workers uh, were retaliating against her because she, uh, they didn't like that she stuck, st stuck up for herself. They didn't like her, her, you know, her pushing back. And uh, an uppity an indigenous mother. What's that? I said an, an uppity indigenous mother. An uppity indigenous woman who didn't know her place. Yeah. So um, this, and, is the, this is the 10 minute mark, Raven. Okay. 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 Yeah. Thank you. Um, and so, so that's basically what I wrote to the judge is that, you know, this, this is an amazing young woman. There's no reason why uh, she shouldn't be investigated. I said, it's the social work agency that should be investigated because not only are they uh, violating the code of ethics, they seem to be breaking the law. <laughs> and within two weeks, he ordered those boys home. <laughs> so I was like, woohoo, <laughs> that was one win. And, you know, we just, we just keep putting one foot in front of the other. And so there are a lot of legal sort of uh, exceptions and concepts that are that are really malleable that are that are used and shaped in any way any way possible to keep our kids to keep our kids and to you know have them placed permanently and they are the best interest of the child right and then attachment so attachment you know seen in woods and it's absolute nonsense it's it's complete fiction but but that's you know that's that's the way it is. <laughs> So, um, you know, and now what's happening is I've heard this from social workers, uh, three across the country in different provinces saying that they're being told to tell parents, don't go through the adoption stream, become a foster parent, because if you have a child for a while, you get to keep them until they're 18. 
Um, and that, to me, that's uh, not only unethical, but it, it strikes me as, uh, as a real violation of something, laws maybe. So impacts and outcomes, Michelle had asked me to speak of. Well, it's, you know, it's a disruption of family connections, that dislocation from our territories. For some reason in Canada, there are so many children who, who for reasons I don't yet know, I still need to figure this out in my research, were, were, were moved into a different province. And, you know, it brings to mind, um, you know, the, the, the Jesuit, the Jesuit records where they talked about, um, if, if we're going to have any success in teaching these independent and autonomous children, who are so loved by their parents that their parents will give them the very food from their mouth if they ask. <laughs> if we're going to disrupt that, if I can teach them and you know to become civilized and good Christians, we have to remove them from their families, the influence of their families, because they're far too autonomous and independent. And uh, you know, I think it's the same thing that you know, if we're going to really, if we're going to to remove children and assimilate them, then the further away that they can be from their 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 territory, the better. And, uh, and there's no rhyme or reason. Uh, some, some were raised right close to their communities and others went to a different province, uh, sort of willingly. It's the disruption of that traditional cultural and familial uh, transmission of knowledge and history, disconnection from our territories and, and the lands and waters and, and trees and animals of our territories. And we can't underestimate the power of that. When I really, really understood that is when I went to Australia back in 2013. One night I stood out and uh, I was looking up at the stars. And I, I'm not an astronomer. I don't, you know, I don't sort of like know many of the constellations, but, but I understood in that moment just how much information we take in unconsciously because I looked at the stars and I could not recognize any of the patterns. And then I really understood how far away I was from home because <laughs> I could see the Northern Cross, right? It's, it's pretty clear, um, but nothing else was familiar. And I actually got dizzy. I got dizzy in that moment. And uh, because we look up at the star stars and we may not know all the constellations and where they should be, but, but our mind does. Our higher wisdom knows where home is. The loss of language, ceremonies, socialization, kinship knowledge. Because we don't just have our families, we have our extended kinship networks. And the loss of our epistemologies, ontologies, and axiologies, which is all about how we know, how we understand reality, and, uh, and, 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 and how that sort of influences our value systems, what, what's important to us. And, you know, I, this was really reflected to me in Jesse Thistle's definition of homelessness which, you know, he says that him, him and his team said that uh, for Indigenous people, homelessness is not, is less about a domicile. It's more about our, our loss of, of family, community, culture, language, ceremony, uh, traditional knowledges, our, our kinship web. And I thought, we were rendered homeless. Indigenous, the 60 scoop survivors were rendered homeless in every sense of the word. And that's imposed trauma, you know, and not to mention <laughs> what happened in those homes. Some had really great experiences and for that I'm really grateful and, you know, I want to acknowledge that there are some some parents who did a, a really stellar, stellar job and I love them for it. That's what the child welfare, welfare system should do is that people come in and provide, um, you know, provide that love and care and nurturing. But many, 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 very high percentage had other nefarious purposes, sexual abuse, physical abuse, psychological torment, isolation, torture. I mean, I, I, I know some people who uh, basically grew up in a, in, a, in a flooded basement and uh, were only allowed out um, to eat, sorry, were only allowed out to work. Their food was literally placed at the top of the stairs and they would work on, you know, work all day, labor all day, didn't go to school. And those st stories are, um, you know, more common than we know. So it talks about uh, about Racine and Woods, and uh, you know, so that so reckoning, right? So you know, when I think about the brown, uh, uh, the uh, well, her name is Sally Matthias, Marcia Brown is is her adopted name. Um, she was the one that put forth the 
the class action suit back in 2004 and and we had our victory in 2017 and uh, I don't know how much of a victory it was because um, um, we certainly didn't get compensated in by any stretch of the imagination it's sort of like we got a we got a we got a few trinkets <laughs> is how it feels we got some beads and trinkets uh, but it but it took you know it took a very long time it took 13 years of of uh, uh, Jeffrey Wilson, who is who is also you know sort of he also had his own child welfare experiences. He was the only willer, lawyer willing to take it up, um, but you know they had to do endless uh, go through endless appeals. They interviewed over two hundred survivors just to to be able to articulate what the case was. And uh, in two thousand thirteen, it was certified as a class action, and and Robert Commando, who was one of the plaintiffs, withdrew because. Um, because he was concerned about all of the abuses in care, and what the what the judge said, the legal system, you know, it's not about it's not about compassion at all. But what it's what they said was, we you won't win if if you include abuses because the federal government will never take responsibility for anything that happened when children were in care, because when children are in care, the provinces act in loco parentis. So when you're in care. Made a crown ward, you're under provincial jurisdiction, and so then it's the province's responsibility to, you know, to sort of oversee your well-being. So they could only they could only uh, launch this lawsuit based on um, loss of culture, and uh, and they won. And so so the most significant outcomes for child welfare, which again, you know, could be a moot point at this point. I'm hoping is that it creates a common law duty of care with respect to the preservation of culture and at least acts as a deterrent to child removal um, and it, and that social work agencies will need to ensure that there's no loss of culture because the precedent has been set and so every province has what's called you know best interest of the child you know stipulations and and they're really lip service right. uh, because from my perspective um, if you're not indigenous then you can't preserve and protect indigenous culture if because you generally know nothing about it so it would be like you know like me um <laughs> trying to preserve and protect uh i don't know sami culture or um uh chinese culture okay i can say oh yeah no problem i'll take them to like you know chinese events and we'll go to chinatown and eat lunch and that sort of thing well that's not that's not culture right those are just the the trappings of culture so we just come into you know into the current day and and what we still have to contend with you know in terms of our political context <laughs> um, and there are perspectives that help us understand some of these contradictions that we see and so here's you know the two ministers of indigenous services and the prime minister wearing these t-shirts every child matters and at the same time what they're doing is underfunding child welfare and then fighting about it in court the federal government spent over a million dollars. No, it was no, it wasn't that much. About one hundred sixty thousand dollars fighting uh, on behalf of FNIB, First Nations Inuit Health Branch, to not provide braces, orthodontic work for a for this young girl, teenager, whose teeth were so malocluded that she could barely eat, and she had constant pain. And and braces are about seven thousand dollars. So here we have you know this this government that's willing to pay. 25 times that to avoid paying it because you know it sets a precedent so we're in this we, we operate in this very bizarre sort of situation it's it could it can almost drive you crazy so this is um bill c92 is you know is it went through the house of commons in january of 20 of last year and it gives indigenous people the opportunity to um to take claim, claim jurisdiction over child welfare and we need to create our you know our 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 bylaws and our laws around that, and uh, and so this is uh, the first sort of post um, bill passing community to do it, and that's uh, um, Kawas's First Nation, and uh, I mean it was very entertaining because Cadmus is, is such a character, and you know he he just likes to have lots of fun, and and he's done some really amazing things, and what's interesting is I've had a chance to see a number of these um, the development of these. Uh, these systems, child welfare systems, you know, that are going to be First Nation run, and invariably they're they're premised upon indigenous knowledge 
and uh, and traditional practices. So, um, Kawasis has what they call an Eagle Woman Tribunal, and so that's where they will. It's it's a group of people, not just women, but lots of women on it. Uh, but that's where they'll hear sort of those those child welfare disputes, and they'll make those legal decisions. Uh, but I also want to point out that the first band in Canada to have jurisdiction is Splatchine in in the interior of BC, a Shwetmik community. Um, and they, they got jurisdiction in 1983 uh, because they, you know, the Indian Act has always said we could establish bylaws. So they, they wrote a child welfare bylaw, sent it to the Minister of uh, Indigenous Affairs for the province, and it got buried in, on his desk. And, and he had 30 days to, to either approve it or veto it. And uh, it got buried in his paperwork. And so after 30 days, it, it went into law. And so for the last, <laughs> for the last 30, what, 38 years, BC has been fighting tooth and nail to uh, to undermine this jurisdiction of Splatchine, but uh, but they they have stayed strong. So um, you know the Yellowhead Institute, which um, is a indigenous think tank, really has, has given Bill C ninety two a, a failing grade primarily because we have to um, we have to. Uh, um, I just need to go back um, because there's no there's no funding <laughs> attached to the bill, and so individual bands or or agencies have to um, negotiate the funding, and and while they're in the negotiation period, there's like gag orders. They can't sort of share that information with anybody else. So, so it's like that divide and conquer approach, and ultimately, it, right, it comes down to to money to the economics. Uh, but we do have the answers, and we have the answers because of great thinkers and uh, like Cindy Blackstock. So the Spirit Bear Plan, it's 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 about you know how do we, you know how do we make changes to the system, and it's absolutely brilliant. I mean, number four here here is um, providing services. Any government department that provides services to to First Nations children and families should undergo a thorough and independent, three hundred and sixty degree evaluation to identify any ongoing discriminatory ideologies policies and practices and address them. I, I mean, this is like, <laughs> this is groundbreaking, right? And I, my hunch is they really don't want to do that. Clearly. But that's exactly the answer right there. If we can get to the there. And in there, we see the reckoning. In exactly. there, we see, we see the recipe for the reckoning and for the reassumption of jurisdiction for the care and protection of Indigenous children. And I know we could go on probably for I'm another. Done, Michelle. I just I just have yeah. a couple more slides that I need to wrap okay. up. All right. Um, we also have the experience. So here's one example: Dakota Ojibwe Child and Family Services. Thirty-five years of delivering Indigenous knowledge-based child welfare, despite being underfunded. And they took over child welfare in in 2021, at least sort of verbally. And what they did was, this infant had been removed from from. Um, his young parents on no, on November 24th of 2020. And on December 29th, uh, Dakota knew that the legislation was coming, back, coming down and went and took this child from provincial foster care and returned, to the, to, returned the child to the, to the family. And the reason this child was removed was because a nurse heard, thought she heard the father to say the word shake he's a Cree speaker. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what he said. And what the wife said was that he was, he was comforting the baby. He was just sort of whispering to the baby because the baby was fussy. And so this is the day that the child was returned or the Friday. And uh, this picture was taken on Monday. And the mother said that that baby hasn't been, uh, hadn't been out of his arms since, since uh, he was returned. So we're still in we're still in a dangerous time, but I'm looking forward to hearing the stories of people, um, you know, people just uh, First Nations taking that jurisdiction and that authority. But the real reckoning is looking at those systems, you know, as Cindy has directed, and uh, and who changes the systems, and you know, when we use when we use systemic perspectives, it it actually absolves individuals of responsibility for racism, discrimination, and oppression, and uh, you know. We can talk about systems until the cows come home, but it's really about really, really doing that deep dive to uh, to look at uh, embedded and habitual racism and discrimination in these systems, um, and and you know professionals hide behind that on a regular basis. 
So, um, you know, there's this notion in our traditional teachings around righteousness that, that and it's not, it's not self-righteousness. It's about, it's about a, a, a justified rage. And, you know, we see it in, in mother bears, right? The one thing you never do with a baby bear is what? <laughs> Pet them. <laughs> Don't do it because you will see a righteous rage. Right? And animals, right? Animals, uh, when they get angry, it's, it's usually justified. There's a good, there's a good reason. And I think the reckoning is that we're at this point, although, you know, I think that we can, we will generally subsume our rage into, into pro productive and, and, uh, and creative means because we have our traditional laws, right? We have our, our creator's laws that apply to all human beings. So there's certain ways that we, you know, we can, we can, um, we can channel that energy to make change. And uh, like one example is sitting in a group of social workers and saying, I know you work with indigenous people, but you really don't know who we are. And then watching the reaction. <laughs> the nerve of you. <laughs> yes, <I dare> you. <laughs> yes. So my last, my last, my closing comment here is, um, you know, my experience as a 60 scoop survivor has been, has been, it was terrible. I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but but it was a real gift because it really motivated me to learn about it and then and then do something about it as much as possible and and even more importantly to uh to parent my child in such a way that uh you know to parent her in the way that i would have wanted wanted to be parented and um uh, and and plus i'm on understanding orders to always have her included in my <laughs> in my powerpoints so she's uh she's growing into a beautiful young woman and and uh, independent and cindy said let's be the first to raise a generation of children who do not have to recover from their childhoods. And I think in order to do that, we really need to be, we need to be fierce. And um, I'm just going to stop sharing here. We, we need to be fierce and we need to be determined. And, uh, and we need, we need to work together. Um, and yeah, so support your communities as they're developing their bylaws. And um, yeah, just, you know, speak out about these, 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 these injustices. So thank you very much for listening. I know I know I've gone over time, and I always, almost always go over time. But uh, what what a privilege is, it is privilege it is to share a little bit about sort of my experience and then some of the things I've learned. And uh, you know I've I to this point you know up to Bill C ninety two what I said to people is if you work in child welfare at all or in politics or law, then um, you know if you're in close close you know quarters with any first uh, indigenous child welfare agency make sure that they put in uh you know immediately implement uh legally binding foster care agreements mm -hmm. i think there's nothing more noble than people uh you know taking another person's child and caring for them and nurturing them uh on a temporary basis but under no conditions should they ever think that that, that gives them a right to, to keep the children permanently uh, because that's that's racist when that happens with indigenous people it's because the system is uh it, it has has very racist sort of foundations and premises and uh and and it violates you know it violates natural law and ethics to to harm children that way so if you're if you are a scoop person um you know i, I hope that some of the things i've said have uh, have helped you and inspired you and uh and thank you for sticking around and and, and coming to this place uh, to join me. So thank you very much. I lift my hands. I'm not from the West Coast, but I've been there lots. And, uh, you know, it's natural to just uh, lift my hands to you all. And much gratitude, all my relations. Hi, hi. Thank you, Raven. That was fabulous. That was just absolutely wonderful. And I, I thank you for bringing your deep knowledge historically politically and analytically in terms of, you know, being able to so astutely analyze the history and the reality of what we've faced in terms of child removal and the impact on that, on or the impact of that on us collectively as a people. Thank you so very, very much. And for the, um, for the people that have been following this series, uh, on October 12th, we'll be joined by Jessica McDermott, who is the author of Highway of Tears. And we'll be speaking about her book about the uh, missing and murdered Indigenous women along Highway 16 and generally. 
and we will be discussing the concept of meaningful allyship and support of Indigenous um, uh, empowerment, if you will. And so with that, thank you very much, Raven, um, and uh, we will call it a night. <laughs>